Hello and welcome to this episode of the Automation Village. This is our seventh episode of our virtual trade show for people in the automation and SCADA industries. I'm Dave Spencer. I'm Chris Little, and uh, this week we're going to focus on our fall road trip. Uh, it's back to school and back to the trade shows. So uh, we're going to be taking a close look at both the AWWA Virtual Summit and the WEFTEC Connect event coming up very soon. That's right. And while you're watching today, instead of our normal format where we're bringing in industry experts to talk about products and things in the SCADA industry, we're actually going to be focused on these trade shows today. So we're going to be talking to the people who would normally be there, running booths and other things, to find out how they're adapting to the virtual environment and give you a little bit of an idea of what you can expect during the virtual trade show. And then we're going to have a roundtable of the Automation Village team who are going to talk about our own experiences uh, during this transition from live events to virtual ones. That's right. And that's going to be with our U.S. sales ma manager, Alan Hudson. They say so we get some of Alan's thoughts on what he's looking forward to as well. And we're also going to have our own producer of the Automation Village Virtual Trade Show, uh, Pete Diffley. He's going to come on and tell us about some of our strategies that we're going to be using going into both the Virtual Summit and the WefTech Connect. That's right. And while you're watching the episode today, we'll, if you've seen the other ones, as per usual, have prizes. So you have the chance to win two $100 gift cards to the largest online shopping voucher that you can think of that we're not allowed to say the name of. <laughs> That's right. So open your email right now and get ready. Uh, the way it works is pretty simple. We're going to put two different, on two different occasions, uh, a phrase on the screen, and you are going to type that phrase in exactly as it is, all uppercase, and uh, a machine will read the results, and uh, whoever uh, is the first one is going to win that prize. That's right. And if you hear us say the clue, take a look down to the side on where the chat box is, because oftentimes oh, Natasha's yeah. in there pasting those phrases right in there. That's right. So get ready for that. And also, uh, that's a nice way to mention uh, Natasha actually is live right now uh, answering your questions. If you've got any observations, uh, you might want to right now type in hi, Natasha, and, uh, and, uh, and hit enter. That's right. So let's get into the show now, Chris. Yes. So uh, coming up next is we're going to have Sam Black from the Electric Machine Company. And uh, this is part of a larger interview he did about their uh, conversion uh, of a SCADA project in Valdosta, Georgia. And it's a bit cut down, so you can see a few edits in it. Sorry about that. Uh, but we cut, I cut it down specifically to focus on uh, his approach to implementing high-performance graphics, which is something you hear a lot about now, which is a, a basically a philosophy of screen development that makes it easier uh, to, to manage more and more uh, screens more effectively. That's right. And at VD Skate Fest, Sam's won our skater shootout on oh, multiple yeah. occasions. So he's a great person to see how he's going about implementing something in VT Skater. That's great. Let's go to that now. Hi, gentlemen. Tell us about EMC. Uh, what do you do and who do you serve? Electric Machine Control is in Trustville, Alabama, which is a suburb of Birmingham. Uh, our primary market for water and wastewater is the Southeast United States. Uh, but industrially, we go all over the world. Uh, we serve uh, OEMs, uh, we serve general industry, and then we have a focus on the water and wastewater market. Great. So how did EMC become involved with the city of Valdosta to begin with? Uh, so, so our initial contact was through a uh, customer referral. Uh, obviously, with the, any type of project like this, it has to go out for competitive bid. Uh, what, what kind of infrastructure was this bid around managing? Okay, so this, this project included a total uh, system upgrade for them, hardware, software, and network uh, uh, infrastructure upgrade. Uh, they have three plants. Uh, they have two wastewater treatment plants and a uh, water treatment plant. Um, they have approximately uh, 40 to 45 uh, remote sites. Those encompass uh, lift stations, water booster stations, water production wells. So Sam, in working on this project, what was your approach to, uh, to getting this done? One of my favorite things about VT SCADA is the way that it handles growth. So we saw that they had you know, so many lift stations we had to integrate. Rather than designing a whole bunch of individual pages for each thing, we can build one master page and parameterize that with widgets and parameters, frankly, um, to build out something that when we need to add a station, uh, all we do is copy paste the tags and link it into a new page. Um, so we can really dive in and make that one screen fantastic. It's 
That's great. So you mentioned screens. Uh, tell me about your process for like what design methodology do you use for creating uh, creating these parameterized reusable pages? Our, our kind of core design concept is high performance graphics. So that means a lot of grayscale, a lot of um, not flashy things that are going to distract you from the action that really needs to grab your eyes. Um, so VT Skate has got a lot of built-in features now where we can put those in without too much effort. Um, it also dictates that you have a, a layered approach to your screens. So you have an overview screen where you get big picture items, click on a component to blow that up and learn more about it. So let's say you've got a, an overview of your collection system. You can click on an item in that collection system to learn more about that station. And now you see, oh, I've got a, a problem with the power. You can click on that and it'll expand out and tell you about specifically what that power problem is. And then one step further even is you can use the built-in trending to click on the problem and see when it happened. How often it's been happening. That's a great description of, uh, of how that works. So often you see people sort of say, uh, oh, the screen is gray. It's high performance. Ta-da! And, and move on from there. But there really is a much larger methodology around that. This is a screen that Sam developed. We read the book uh, that was written for high performance graphics. We saw some examples in there. One of the things they showed is that wasn't related to uh, collection or distribution systems is how they applied high performance graphics to train schedules for subway views. How they how they figured out you know where the trains running on time and getting to where they needed to go. We thought, hey, pushing water down a pipe isn't much different than a train. So let's develop a screen that gives a bird's eye view to a customer. So you can see with this screen right here, this is an adaption of that subway view. Yeah, this is so kind of using some of the more modern uh, features in VT SCADA. As a smaller collection system, we're able to foot, fit more information on the screen. Uh, we noticed that when people were opening these pump station views, uh, the thing that they were most interested in was what have the pumps been doing as far as running history and what have the what has the well been doing as far as level history. So with the extra real estate afforded by a high resolution screen, uh, we've taken that information and embedded it directly on the subway view. So here at a glance, you can see, you know, are my pumps alternating? Have the levels done anything strange recently? How do my comms look? It still follows the same principle of, you know, white is running. <clears throat> so you can get the same information. Uh, we've also broken out the uh, information available on the overview screen a little bit more in depth. Um, so on stations that uh, support it tag wise, uh, we've actually got little icons that show you where a problem's coming from. So here you can see at this station, it not only has a problem, we can say that the problem is with pump three. And if you want to learn more about that, you would click into it. So we get our sort of level two screen here. We can see in the station, pump three does have a fault. If you wanted to learn more about that pump, you can click on it there, or you can click on it here. So this is kind of a way to drill down into every possible piece of information about that station. But again, you can see we've got our trend on level and our trend on pump run status. All that data is available at a glance on the main screen. And the information that you see between those two boxes, uh, we're scraping that from the USGS, you know, basically NOAA's website, uh, weather.gov. Um, they want to know wind speed. They want to know precipitation. Uh, that gauge height is the local river. Uh, discharge is uh, the calculated uh, flow through that river right, right at the moment. That's important for them to know. So we, we've scraped that data and brought that in and they can trend that and compare it. So like the precipitation, they can compare that um, to what's going through their stations and identify I and I issues. Yeah, so, so you can see an anomaly right there. Yeah, we so by scraping data through JSON drivers, you can sort of cross-reference that against what your stations are doing. Uh, so at the top, you've got your transducer level at that station over the last four weeks. Underneath that, you've got the gauge height of the river. And under the, underneath that, you've got the river discharge. So you see that the gauge height and the discharge are, are pretty closely related, as you'd expect. Beneath that, you've got the uh, number of pump starts for that station. You know, without these middle two graphs, you might just look at this trend and say, oh, what happened on June 7th? Is there a problem with the station? But by comparing it against data from the river, you can say, oh, there must have been a rain event. This is normal operation and nothing to worry about. Uh, another thing we've been playing with is this radar chart. Um, so we, we um, use some scripting to run a calculation on what sorts of problems your system is having, whether that's a communication problem, a panel problem, pumps, wet wells. Um, and it uses that to form a KPI for, you know, how is your system doing at this moment? So these, these lines here will pull in and out depending on what areas of your system need improving. 
we always have, when we go out and we talk to utilities, they're like, hey, we need to know when we have problems. For example, a high level. Hey, I want to know when I have a, a high level at my lift station. We always say, well, that's too late. Don't you want to know before you have a high level? And that's, that's the whole purpose behind this design. You know, we always have people say we want accuracy. Well, we always say, well, you know, accuracy is important. You can calibrate for accuracy as long as things are repeatable. So what we want to show them is that, hey, the system's healthy and everything is repeating like it should. When you see a deviation from a repetitive performance, then you have to start paying attention to it. And if you start seeing those deviations and the way Sam's got this laid out here, you can start determining things when they're deviating from normal. You can get ahead of the high level. Uh, tell me about the uh, architecture of the completed system in terms of servers and, and everything. Sure. Uh, it's sort of a spoken hub. Uh, we have a central admin building that has a big beefy server and a strong internet connection. Um, that internet connection is backed up by a um, Verizon APN. Uh, all of our remote sites are actually inside of a private Verizon cloud uh, for security purposes. Um, so each, each facility ties back into that central building and again amongst themselves through a VPN and the county network. And they can also see each other through the Verizon APN. So there's, there's multiple ways that the different servers can connect with each other. Um, and each one is backing each other's historical data up uh, with the goal that if something were to happen to one server, um, you still have your data. Great. So how many levels of redundancy do you think the system has? Oh, gosh. Uh, In terms of backing up historical uh, data? Uh, you've got, at the water plant, for example, you've got two servers on site. So I guess that's one layer of redundancy. Then right. you've got another layer with being in a different building, you've got that spoke to the admin building. Uh, so that's, that's, I guess, a second layer of redundancy. Yeah. Uh, and then from there, it, it can go to the other buildings too. So, I mean, really, you'd have to try pretty hard. <laughs> that's amazing. So you've got a lot of, uh, you've got a, a whole geographically separated disaster backup of the entire application in a bunch exactly. of different locations. That's great. Oh, so, I should mention all the, uh, the hard drives are rated as well. So oh, I see. Another level. <laughs> just, uh, just explain briefly what that means for people who don't know what a RAID drive oh, is. Oh, sure. Yeah, um, with rotating media, um, there is always a chance that something goes wrong and suddenly your hard drive is trashed. Uh, so if you put it in a, uh, I think it's RAID 1, um, you can basically mirror the data between the two drives so that if one fails, you get a warning saying, hey, replace my other drive soon. James, tell me about how does the customer feel about the new system? What was some of the feedback that you got? Oh, they, they, they love it. They're seeing things that uh, they've never been able to see before. Hmm. They're identifying I and I issues. Um, they're getting to view things now when, uh, you know, when they're not at work, they can log on and get, get a certain amount of comfort that everything is, is happening the way that it should. So uh, they, they like it. Well, excellent. Thank you, James Denton and Sam Black of Electric Machine Control. Uh, thanks for your time today. Have a great week. Thanks, you too. Thanks a lot, Sam. And if you want to watch that full interview, you can do that just by clicking the link down below in the description. Right, and while you're down there, you can also click the link to vote for us for product of the year for oil and gas in the IoT uh, category. Yeah, and while you're there, uh, you should be close to that big red subscribe button. You may as well click that, get that out of the way right now. That's right, and in thanks for you listening to this self-propaganda, we, <laughs> we should give away a prize. Yes, let's do that. So open up your email and uh, type into the to field, natasha.lutz at trihedral.com. That's right. And in the subject line, you're going to type AWWA Virtual Summit, just as you see it on the screen, all uppercase and with the spaces where you see. Also, as noted earlier, you can also check the little chat window to see it there. You may copy and paste it in. So put that, send it off to Natasha, and you may have a chance of winning a $100 gift card to the largest online shopping retailer <laughs> that we can think of that we can't say. And uh, there's some rules involved. Obviously, we can't win. The people who work at our company can't win, or any of our families, or, or any of the presenters today, or their families. But otherwise, everyone can win. And if you want to see all the rules, they're uh, down in the description as well. There's a lot of things in the description. You might want to go root around <laughs> down there. Yes, we pride ourselves on having the longest descriptions on YouTube, <laughs> if nothing else. We win every year. So what's <laughs> up next? Uh, oh, Pete, producer Pete. Right. Yeah, so next up, so, we've got a video from our uh, Pete Diffley, who's in our North Carolina office. And Pete's going to do an introduction to you to the fall road trip. 
My name is Pete Diffley. I'm the Senior Manager for Global Partnerships for Trihedral, as well as the producer for the Automation Village. I'd just like to welcome you to North Carolina in the fall. I live south of the beautiful city of Charlotte, near a quaint little town called Waxhaw. It has an iconic water tower that looks down on an old wooden footbridge that straddles a railway line. You can potter around the wonderful antique and curiosity stores or get a bite to eat at one of the many fine restaurants. This is one of my favourites, Mary O'Neill's, a genuine article Irish bar and restaurant that is well worth a visit. Of all the places I've been to around the world, this unassuming ice cream store makes some of the nicest handmade ice cream I've ever tasted. North Carolina has lots to do, from the highly engaging Wright Brothers historic site at the Outer Banks to the breathtaking Blue Ridge Mountains. You are never short of adventure. Fall brings with it incredible changes in scenery with stunning rich colours. Taking a road trip or hike along the Appalachian Mountains is terrific. What, you thought they were called the Appalachians? There is a fun waterfall driving tour you can take there also. It takes about five or six hours. Take a trip to the magnificent Biltmore House Estate in Asheville. It's amazing to think that this house had electricity, a heated indoor swimming pool, and even the first passenger electric elevator in North Carolina at the end of the 1800s. Chimney Rock and Lake Lure are also in the Blue Ridge Mountains, but did you know that this is where they filmed Dirty Dancing? If you want to dance Johnny and Baby style on the infamous dance floor from the movie, pay a visit to the Esmeralda Hotel there. Finally, North Carolina has a wonderful balloon festival on October 2nd, Though you might want to avoid taking a trip when lightning is about, just speaking from personal experience, that is. I hope you enjoyed our little tour of North Carolina. See you soon. All right. Thanks, Pete, for putting that video together. That was great. You always do a great job with your videos. Great, and as promised, uh, coming up is our AWWA Virtual Summit and WEFTEC Connect preview, where we've invited on a handful of industry professionals uh, from companies whose logos you would uh, recognize from, from giant trade show booths from every show you've ever been to. And uh, each one's going to talk about either uh, different events that they've seen that they're looking forward to, or uh, approaches that, they're, that they like, or ways in which they're going to actually be presenting at these, uh, these brand new virtual events. So the first one is Travis Smith and he's with Xylem Census and he's going to talk about a variety of the presentations that he's looking forward to. Hi Travis, welcome. How are you today? Doing well Chris, thanks for having me back on the program. I'm glad to have you here. Let's talk a little bit about the upcoming AWWA Virtual Summit. Uh, what are some of the benefits to an event like this going virtual? As I've witnessed several virtual conferences over the past several months, one of the things I've found is you don't always have to attend the live event. Uh, the events are recorded. And if you have a schedule conflict or if they're in the case of the virtual summit for AWWA, there might be two or three interesting sessions scheduled at the same time. So unlike an in-person event where you must choose uh, to attend one of those things, with a virtual event, you can come back and look at the playback and still absorb that content and get that knowledge at a later date. It's true, you really can be everywhere at once. So as you look through the lineup to, to this event, what are some of the topics and activities that are jumping out at you? There's a lot of great content out there, Chris. Uh, six particular things caught my eye, but that, that's my eye. And some things might be right for other folks. I picked out uh, these following sessions, the two-way street building with your customers. I see that as more and more paramount for utilities to communicate with their customers, particularly highlighted from a COVID-19 pandemic, that interface with them became more and more important. Uh, and to be able to do it virtually also is important. So I'm excited to see what they have to say there. Secondly, the legal and operation aspects of PFAS, I think it's a burgeoning issue in the industry uh, with a lot of contention and possible litigation in there. So getting a better understanding of that would be valuable. Uh, thirdly, I saw keep calm and communicate through challenges. Uh, utility case studies are always interesting to me, bringing that reality of, of use cases and how the utilities use technology to solve problems 
super valuable. So I would never want to miss one of those if I could attend it or, or listen to it on a recording. Fourth, I saw a fireside chat with the EPA. Always, always good to get their insights, see where they are moving. We've got some big issues in play, PFAS being one of them we talked about just a minute ago. And if there are other future regulations or monitoring concerns coming down the pipe, certainly want to get ahead of those versus being behind them. So I would never miss an EPA opportunity to, to learn from them. Uh, also, there was a session on new developments and disinfection byproducts, occurrence, precursors, sources, and monitoring tools. I think that's a big future issue for the water industry. We see urbanization, longer supply chains, more water stress, hotter climates. Uh, those generations of disinfection byproducts and their health implications, important subject. I'd like to stay ahead of that versus be behind that. And lastly, I thought there was a great session on non-revenue water use cases with U.S. utilities. Great issue, great opportunity for some utilities to get some financial efficiencies uh, and break that vicious budget cycle that they might be in. So I would certainly want to learn from some of those use cases that are out there. Uh, those are a lot, there's a lot of good content. Those were the ones that caught my eye, Chris. That's great. So what are you looking forward to the most? You know, ACE and, and the virtual summits are kind of replacing it this year is a great opportunity to learn from the industry, the customer utilities, consultants, suppliers, technology. Uh, I'm looking forward to learning what's new, uh, how people are using technology, how people are solving problems, and get that reality use case back there uh, to bring that back into the work that we do well as help utilities solve problems. That's great. Now, uh, what advice would you give to an industry professional, like a superintendent or an operator or anyone who goes to these live events, you know, looking to, to, to solve a problem? What advice would you give them uh, when going through that same process in a virtual trade show environment? I would encourage them to feed their curiosity, ask yeah. questions. Uh, presenters love questions. The reality of the questions being married with the solutions really brings it home for me when I'm presenting at those types of forums. Uh, and, and it personalizes it, you'll get a better understanding of the technology as it replies to you or the use cases it applies to your utility. So bring the personal challenges forward to the presenters, uh, whether it's in at the live event in the open forum or even afterwards, bring those things back to so they can be tangible to your utility and useful to you. Thanks, Travis. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with Travis Smith, the Senior Director of Water Marketing at Census, you can do so using his contact information in the description for this live stream. Thanks for joining us, Travis. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again, Chris. So next up, we have Hawk, who everyone is familiar with seeing at trade shows. And uh, we're going to have Pam Moss, who is an application development manager. And she's going to be talking about uh, not only their, their new approach to the virtual trade show, but also talking about some of the products that they're going to be focusing on. Cool. I'm looking forward to it. My name is Pam Moss, and I am an application development manager with Claros Digital Solutions with Hawk. My focus is data management, process management, and instrument management for our customers. Thank you to the Automation Village for having us here today. We very much appreciate that and appreciate this wonderful program the Automation Village is putting on. So a lot of discussion has happened at Hawk, as well as with um, other vendors in our world that we've talked with, is what are we all doing to support AWWF in this time of COVID as we switch to a virtual world? So yes, Hawk is absolutely a strong supporter of AWWA and WEF, and we will be at the AWWA Summit here at the end of the month, as well as the WEF Tech Connect in October. We're going to use the tools they provided, and they both have done a great job. There's opportunities for virtual exhibits, virtual chat rooms. We've done some pre-records of a lot of our items, um, so they will be running through the booths. But we'll have time to chat to each other virtually. So we very much look forward to seeing you all there at AWWA and at WEFTEC. But also, we've done a lot with the state association as well as many of the vendors who participate in this automation village. Many of the state organizations starting in March, and the first one where I live in the Carolinas was in South Carolina, they had a very large conference that quickly had to be canceled because of COVID. And what do we do? How do we handle that information getting out to the water industry through a virtual environment. So a lot of the states have done a great job between AWA WEF, partnering with the community college, partnering with operators associations, partnering with other associations to be able to develop and produce 
many virtual schools, virtual conferences, virtual exhibits, and virtual workshops. So we're very much a supporter of that, and thanks to all those volunteers and those associations who have made all that possible. So we at Hawk, what do we do with all the events we do? So we've had all those conversations and how to do a quick, quick turnaround to go to virtual. One thing that many of our data management users are very familiar with with Hawk Wins is we've had our virtual user group meetings this year. We've had seven of them. Where we've included our instrument management side and our process management side. So starting in June, coming in through this month, we spend three hours in these events. We hear from customers what they're doing with the solutions, both drinking water and wastewater, as well as Hawk experts. We used to do about 42 in-person live events around the US and Canada, but this year we all had to change, both us and our customers, to be able to service the water industry. So we're pretty excited about those programs. They've been over 100 people per session, so great, great turnout. We've also done a national conference for our Claros platform. We're in our fifth year. We were going to be in Orlando. Actually, I'm looking at the calendar. Actually, I think it was this week. But of course, we can't be there in person. So we are switching our national conference. We call it the Claros Summit to a virtual event the last two weeks in uh, October. It'll be the week of October 19th and the week of October 26th. We're going to do five days and about three hours per day. So folks will be able to log into the sessions they want to hear. Again, our users will be presenting. They're a huge part of this, um, this production, as well as many Hawk experts, both training. Uh, we'll have some fun Jeopardy games. Try to do as much as we can virtually to really have a great learning environment. So all of us have had to change very quickly to the virtual world and adapt, because our goal is the protection of public health and the water environment. That is all of our chief goal. So some of you may ask, what is this Claros platform I'm talking about? First, you can go uh, to a website for our Claro Summit, where you can take a look at the agenda, et cetera, and take a look at all the presenters that are going to be there, but they'll show the website here. Secondly, to really learn more about Claros, let's start a little bit at that 30,000-foot view. Claros is the name of the overall water intelligence platform at Hawk. Our goal is to take our data management side, because it is all about the data, our instrument management side and our process management side and make these flow together so much easier to make your job at the plants, water, wastewater, industrial, to make your job just so much easier in working with powerful SCADA systems and other tools you have at hand. Goal is compliance, absolutely, but it's also efficient operations, running your business and being effective, as well as mitigating risk for your employees during this COVID-19 time. So data management, our solutions are our Hawk WIMS, Water Information Management Solutions, and our field data collection tool called Collect. Our instrument management, and we have a whole bunch of instruments now where it's not just about the data point coming off, you know, a two NTU from a turbidimeter, or maybe a, you know, you know, three milligram per liter from an ammonia probe or analyzer. It's about the metadata within that instrument to let us know when maintenance needs to be done, has that maintenance been done? How do you do the maintenance? So we can make sure we're delivering high quality data coming out of those process instruments and probes. Then the third platform is process management where we're taking all this data and really help to run processes and make those processes more efficient. So a lot going on in Hawk World with our Claros, a water intelligence platform. But I appreciate being here today. Thanks again to the Automation Village. I hope you guys enjoy the program today. Thank you. Thanks for your thoughts on that, Pam. Great. So next up, we have Jarrett Slate. He's the Chief Operating Officer for California Motor Controls. And he's going to talk about some of the things that he's looking forward to uh, with the upcoming shows. And also, he gives some tips and tricks for attendees of how to get the most out of these events. Hi, Jarrett. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Chris. So for many companies, trade shows, in-person trade shows, are a very important part of their sales cycle. Uh, how has the switch to virtual events uh, changed how California Motor Controls reaches out to customers? Well, in-person trade shows have never been a, a big part of California Motor Control's customer acquisition strategy, uh, even though we still like presenting at uh, the national shows and also attending a lot of different shows. 
Uh, we've tried some print advertising in the past and have never really been pleased with the return on those investments. Uh, but we have had some success with our uh, periodic social media presence, but ultimately have had very good organic growth by letting our quality of work and customer service experience speak for themselves. Uh, we've been very fortunate in the fact that we've actually been pursued by customers who, um, who've seen our products and are looking for a different customer vendor relationship, a, a true partnership. It's true. Uh, word of mouth is a powerful thing, especially when it comes to uh, just being able to deal with a company for a long time. These, these uh, applications are are, are long-term relationships that can last for decades. Uh, so as we come up upon the AWWA Virtual Summit and the WefTech Connect events, uh, the first iteration of these things, uh, what are you looking forward to the most? Well, because this is gonna be a very new experience industry-wide, uh, I, I personally am most looking forward to seeing how it, how it all goes, both mm -hmm. from uh, an, an exhibitor and an attendee perspective. I know California Motor Controls were sort of taking a uh, let's you know sit back and, and see approach, uh, but I'm very excited to see the creativity both from the show show's producers um, as well as to each individual exhibitor to see the differences in marketing strategy from companies both big and small, and lastly to see who's truly been able to embrace this new platform and, and what all of that actually looks like. Right. It's true. It, it'll, it's an interesting opportunity to look around the field and see who really can innovate when they have Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, for putting on our, our, uh, our trade show visitor hat, uh, uh, what advice would you have for an attendee, um, uh, not a vendor, who usually walks up and down the aisles of one of these trade show centers, uh, collecting some swag, and, and trying to find answers to specific problems that they have? Uh, what advice would you have for them in, in this new venue? Um, my advice for attendees is, is really to take a portion of that time one would spend traveling um, and attending an in-person trade show, a destination trade show, to experiencing this new platform. Um, my fear is that when we remain at home, uh, um, we'll let our daily work get in the way of, of a great uh, educational opportunity where we would learn about new products that are on the market. So spend time researching the exhibiting companies, especially the smaller companies who do not garner a lot of the, the foot traffic from the live shows. Mm -hmm. uh, you should be able to tell a lot about a company from viewing their virtual booth, um, but also just clicking on the, the company's website homepage. So, um, ultimately, it's going to take the willingness to commit the time to, to get the full experience of this new platform. That's great advice. So uh, obviously, your uh, email address is down in the description below for the live stream. Uh, but if people want to look for you on social media, what's the, wh what's the best place to look? Um, on, on LinkedIn, um, either from our company's homepage or, or my, my personal uh, LinkedIn page. That's great. Well, thank you, Jared Slate from California Motor Controls. Uh, we appreciate your time today, and we uh, hopefully look forward to seeing you at, at a real live uh, trade show soon. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Great work, Jared. We really appreciate you putting that together. Great. And now over to Norm Anderson. He's the EI and C engineer at Corolla Engineers. Uh, he's somebody that we uh, often meet at the real life, uh, real flesh and blood trade shows. Uh, so it's nice to see him here. And he's going to talk about some of the things that he's looking forward to. Great. Hi, Norm. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Chris. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Glad to have you. So uh, how do you plan to approach the new virtual environments for the AWWA Virtual Summit and WefTech Connect? Well, we've got a few things um, planned that we're going to be doing at both. So the way we're supporting the AWWA event right now is we actually are, are hosting the YP committee and the discussion that's going on um, along with that. And additionally, we're supporting the Water Utilities Technology and Automation Committee. So there's going to be um, several talks and, and kind of sessions that are along those lines. And, and we kind of continue to support that along through the entire year as well. Um, over at WefTech, um, we have a very strong uh, group of people. We have over 20 presentations that we're actually doing at that mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, those are ranging everything from resiliency planning to uh, membrane biotechnology for direct potable reuse, um, all the way to real-time monitoring of collection systems. And 
one of the neat things about that is that, you know, not only do we have all these technologists that are developing this technology, but, um, you know, at Corolla, we're, we're actually doing the automation and a lot of the things behind the scenes as well. Wow. So that we, um, you know, working firsthand at doing the implementation of all these great technologies that, you know, you'll see out at the conference. So you guys are going to be pretty busy. How do you plan to uh, keep up outreach uh, and actually connecting to people during these events? So we've got a, key, a few key things um, you know, developed for both. So the YP event is one of the big ones at AWWA, and that one's actually um, focusing, has a, has a big focus on um, diversity and outreach within the water community. So basically looking at, you know, the, the engineers of the future, uh, water operators of the future, and looking at how that can be a more diverse class of people to help us support, mm -hmm. you know, water moving into the future and water conservation. And at, and at WEF Tech, we've got an um, interesting opportunity where we're working with their uh, inflow group, uh, which brings in uh, university students from underprivileged communities and actually helps them network within the water community. So one of the ways we do that is um, hosting a big networking event virtually through there. Um, and another is um, networking on hot topics. And so the one that we are leading right now is actually looking at uh, you know, climate change and, and vulnerabilities in our climate system and how they affect right. water systems. And, you know, helping teach these students about these things so that when they go out and look for jobs and, and, you know, things like that, that they're well prepared to talk about these, you know, emerging issues. Wow, you've got a lot going on. So while you guys are so busy doing all of these things, you've still got customers to take care of and, and new customers to find. How are you continuing to work with your clients and, and provide solutions during all of this activity? Yeah, and so that's definitely been a challenge too, especially, you know, with uh, going virtual on everything. Right. You know, one of the things is we, we, we do try to do things like this as well and have a lot of Teams meetings. Um, uh, we've been gone 100% virtual with all of our employees, so all of our employees are set up to do things virtually. And um, we still know we have to service our clients directly, so we've kind of set protocols in place. We have our own safety standards and we follow our client safety standards and uh, still go out in the field, get the work done, eat with people when we need to. And um, so far, things have been running pretty smooth. <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks, Norm. I appreciate your insight. And uh, I look forward to seeing all the different things that you're doing. If people want to get in touch with Norm Anderson, he is the principal EI and C engineer for Corolla Engineers. Uh, his email address is in the live stream description right below. Thanks, Norm. Hey, thank you, Chris. So if you would like to contact any of these organizations or find out how to reach them at these virtual events, uh, you could do so using the links in, again, uh, below us in the description to this live stream. Perfect. And next up, we're going to have another video from Pete. And Pete's going to be telling you a little bit about what you can see at the VT Skater booths at both the AWWA and the upcoming WEFTEC virtual trade show. So we've done a few things in there to make it interesting, and we'll let Pete give you that introduction to what's to come. Thanks guys. At this year's AWWA and WEF Tech Connect shows, we will have the Automation Village VW bus there. And we will be broadcasting live via our web portal. Once you log in and come to our virtual booth, you should be able to access our Automation Village live stream. You can interact with our hosts, chat with our booth uh, staff, and find out lots of information on VT Scala features uh, through interactive demos. We will also be doing some show reports from the trade show floor, uh, where our team will be reporting on interesting solutions that uh, they come across throughout the events. So that's about it, really. Uh, please keep an eye on our website for more details on all of this, and we're really looking forward to seeing you all there. Thank you. Hey, everybody. We're all together on one screen at last. Uh, this is the entire virtual trade show team, with the exception of Pete Diffley. Hi, Pete. Uh, so these are all the people who bring to you the virtual trade show every month. Uh, now, Alan, of course, you've met before. Hi, Alan. Hello there, Chris. And Natasha, of course, uh, you know from the, uh, the, all of the promotion leading up to this, and also she's usually the one on the live stream doing the, the, doing the chat and the talk back. So nice to have you here in person. So uh, obviously, over the last six months, uh, the sales industry and also the specifically the trade show industry, has been dragged kicking and screaming about uh, eight years into the future. Uh, and that's going about as well as you would expect, uh, in both all the good ways and bad ways. Uh, so as a group of people, we have the unique advantage of being on both the side of the people who attend these things uh, and also the side of the people who run and, and manage them. So let's talk a little bit about that experience, especially over the last few months. Natasha, uh, you've been running a number of different events. 
Uh, tell us about how things, what it was like on the inside when things began to change. Yeah, sure. So um, one of the, la well, the last event that we did live was VT Skate Fest back in March in Orlando. And on the day that we were wrapping that up, there was a large show that was supposed to be um, starting that Saturday morning in the Orange County Convention Center. And all the booths were set. Um, and we got word that the show canceled Friday afternoon. So which is quite shocking when you think of there's a whole convention center now full of booths that no one's ever going to see. <laughs> and so people think um, that may attend these shows don't know the all the planning that goes into it on months uh, beforehand. What people may not know is before we even leave shows, like WEFTEC or AWWA ACE, um, is we book our booth space the, for the next year at the show. So some of these are a year in the planning. And things that some people might not think about is months before even you go to one of these large shows is you have to survey your booth staff. Do you have all the same color company shirt? Do we all have the appropriate attire so we don't look mismatched in the booth? That's important. Um, that's something that maybe attendees might not think about in advance. Uh, things about sending all your booth collateral materials, you have to do that weeks and weeks in advance to make sure that, well, especially for us, it clears customs, um, our headquarter, of course, being in Canada. Um, and being a software company, we have to think of far in advance of the version we're going to show, creating demos that are applicable and relevant to the show. So at ACE, we want to make sure we have lots of water uh, demos, uh, water content in our demos. At WEFTEC, it's, it's more geared toward wastewater. So all of those things go into it as well um, that I think maybe people might not think about when they attend the show. So, Alan, from the point of view of the U.S. sales manager for, for VT Skata, uh, how has your sales book or how, how have things changed for you on the fly during this process? <laughs> well, for one thing, I'm not getting near as many frequent flyer miles with hotel points. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say from the other side, you know, for about three weeks or so, everyone struggled as to how they were going to interact with each other. You know, we were thinking about this two-week flatten the curve thing, which is now drug into months and months. Probably in two months uh, into the whole um, shutdown, people started realizing, here's how I can make these things work. More, more than just, you know, Zoom calls or go to meetings, you know, web, web calls, it really became into how can I make our time together really impactful? Uh, and if I can just take a second and share a quick story. Um, I, I grew up in, uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, but my, my grandparents were from rural Alabama, uh, and, and I never knew my grandmother to be out of, uh, out of her bed or out of her bedroom. She was an invalid. And uh, when you were at grandma's house, uh, if when you got in trouble, you always had to go sit in grandma's room for about 15 minutes. So th that was our time out. Uh, I, I got in trouble a bunch. My, my sisters always got me in trouble. So I spent a lot of time out in my grandmother's room. But one, one of the things she taught me was, she says, Alan, all you can control is your attitude. And so with that in mind, I moved into this world of having to do things differently. And all I can control is how do I approach this, this new, new normal or, or do the new conditions? And with that being said, I moved into a place of how can I still interact and make sure people know that I care about being with them, even though it is virtual, they also know that, that I want to develop a relationship with them. I also value their time more effectively. And so now I can now create demos that are really fine-tuned toward what they want to hear as well. So really that entire change became where I could take my, my desk area, turn that into my trade show area, and now have all the tools at my disposal to make life really, really meaningful with what they wanted to see. Now, the other part of that was as an attendee or as a hearer, they had to get comfortable as well that they could now dynamically say, hey, Alan, talk about that again. Do you mind covering this piece again? You know, show me the reaction if I show you a, a feature or a benefit that it, it does matter to what you're, you're trying to do. Once we had that figured out, then life became different. Now, as, as uh, offices began opening up in June, we started traveling again. What we actually started doing, as well as going to customers' facilities with our masks on, of course, 
Um, we also started doing things differently, like having a, a presentation in the park, for lack of better words. You know, going into an area, so now you have a covering, uh, and, and yet you can still do a demo. People can come in, sit at picnic tables, still be distance apart, and now you do have face-to-face -face, um, uh, uh, presentations and meetings as well. Again, it became a time of adjustment. How am I still going to make this work? How am I going to make it meaningful? How are we going to move forward with, with, uh, with projects and with advancements? And that's been exciting uh, as well as challenging all on the line. That's great. So Dave, uh, like, like many of us, you wear a lot of hats, uh, one of them being direct sales, where you actually uh, are responsible for approaching customers, uh, but also you wear a lot of technical hats uh, where you're doing like Google AdWords, you're working on the website, uh, on the forum. Um, tell us a little bit about how those strategies have changed during this time. Yeah, obviously that's become a big thing for us because not only being at the show, do you, do you get kind of a visual presence? One of the things that um, the show allows us to do is to to meet a lot of people just because we happen to be in a similar space. So it's like I say, it's at the trade show is obvious. People are drifting by and people start to see your branding and other things and and sort of become a little curious or become uh, you know insightful and want to see exactly what you have to offer. But also a big place where I've met a lot of really interesting people who maybe weren't looking for us at the trade show is things like the airport and other things. You know, the lineup waiting to get on your airplane is a great place <laughs> to talk to the people in front and behind you. And uh, a lot of the time going to and from the shows, these are very relevant people. So, you know, I've had some great conversations just in my travels to and from the shows. Um, I think that's really good. They say for us, obviously, you know, we've turned up our marketing and other things digitally to try to get some of that outreach. Like we have some fairly targeted marketing that we do, but we also have a marketing campaign that's really just sort of like an explosion of, you know, anybody who may be relevant will do this. And, you know, we do these little bursts of things where we say, just show some ads and, you know, see who maybe is that, that person that's, you know, scrolling through Facebook while they're waiting to get on their flight and hasn't engaged with us at all in the past, but maybe is curious about seeing that VT Skata ad the same way as they may have seen the VT Skata on my shirt or whatever when we're standing in lineup. So um, yeah, that's, I mean, we're trying to trying to replicate some of those things as best we can, but at the same point, um, yeah, capturing those people is the real challenge now is okay, they've seen it, they've engaged and maybe they click your ad, um, but you don't get that personal touch quite yet. So we're still working on how we can make the experience a little bit better. So you're trying to, to really draw them in so that they can make the first move. Where, That's right, where yeah. The first move was them walking into your booth. Yeah, if we were to make that click of that ad, call my phone, it might be a little aggressive. <laughs> they may not appreciate <laughs> that, but um, right. taking them to you know a very generic page is um, right. you know not quite getting the same impact as it would to be able to speak with someone. So. They say is uh, we're still playing with that middle ground to see see what we can do. So, uh, in the context of trade shows, uh, obviously everyone can do uh, do a ten minute routine on on the challenges of virtual trade shows. Uh, but obviously, that they open up some doors. So, what are some of the positive opportunities that a, that a virtual trade show provides? Hey, I'll answer that one, Chris. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. So, I actually made a list of this in the last few weeks. I, I really tried to come to. Um, to a point of how do I make the most of my time, but also the other attendees' time. You know, as you said earlier, um, we have the unique position of being both a, a vendor as well as an attendee. And so with that in mind, the kind of things I thought about were, number one, we actually have a lot more people to be attending trade shows this year that oftentimes don't get to go. You know, so many times it's about the person who needs PDHs or CEUs, or maybe the person who's presenting and now we may have somebody sitting in an office somewhere that can attend part of a show, whereas before they couldn't do it because of budget constraints or responsibilities at home. So with that being said, we have a, a broader audience, perhaps. The second thing is, because you can now, I'll just say, browse the show electronically, you can now see vendors or see even attendees that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. You know, you can go into to booths that you might not have explored because maybe you didn't have a real need for that. Or maybe you were intimidated, perhaps the line was so long, you really couldn't get in there. So now you have that opportunity. Uh, one of the things I thought about was that, uh, again, without the whole masking thing, you people can see if, if they really care about being there or not, you can judge that. But, but even from there, taking it where they can have meaningful conversations. 
you know, more than just a, a two and a half minute because the group of folks you're with are, are, are walking by, they step into the booth, you know, scan my badge and then contact me later. They can now come into the booth, so to speak, and can now engage in a real conversation. And perhaps that even leads to a further conversation or presentation, even right there, or maybe a, a follow up of some sort. I guess a final thing about that is, um, I think as an attendee, one of the struggles you have, or even as a vendor, is, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. I, or I'm starving. What do I do about this? Right. And you, you, you're, you're, on, you're on booth duty for you know, like two hours or whatever. And now you can step away for that minute and a half, get a refill of coffee, go to the bathroom, uh, you know, those kinds of things. From a vendor that can show up in things like a regular T-shirt, you know, they don't necessarily have to even shave, right? All those kind of things become a nice change to where when the barriers come down, the barriers that became uh, hurdles for, for doing the best at a trade show as an attendee or as a, vid, uh, a vendor, all those barriers come down. And now all of a sudden you can be much more productive in the shorter amount of time, be more efficient, and then also end up with a better product. Right. And, and you can be in many places at once, which is always a challenge, especially like at VT Skater Fest. Whereas uh, if, if you wanted to see two things that were happening concurrently, you know, you'll, you, you just have to pick. So yeah. what that ultimately means, I guess, uh, for these trade show environments, you've got, uh, again, the presentations that they always had. Uh, you've got the exhibit hall. You've got all sorts of different things. But ultimately, it comes down to them looking at a screen and you being on the other end of it. Right. Uh, what are the best practices uh, from the point of view, let's start with uh, with with attendees. Uh, how do people get the most out of that experience and not just sort of go, wow, I spent the day staring at my computer. It was amazing. Dave. Yeah, I think that that is going to be a big challenge. And I think people are going to be taking this much more in dissected bits. I don't think anybody's mm -hmm. going to be expected to stand in front of their screen for the entire day. Right, it's true. Uh, but one of the things I was thinking of too was that uh, you know a lot of the kids are going back to school right now. A lot of those kids are going back virtually, uh, so a lot of the same best practices would apply uh, to to attendees, which is uh, take some notes, uh, be a bit proactive, uh, decide what it is you if you're attending a, a live presentation on Zoom, decide ahead of time what it is you want to learn from that. Uh, take some notes so that you're doing active listening because I'm really bad at. <laughs> doing other things while they're meeting, you know, while, not a meeting, uh, while things are going on. <laughs> and, uh, so it just keeps you focused, uh, keeps you from checking your email. Uh, and at the end of it, then you've got questions. You've got, maybe they didn't cover what you wanted to learn and they always have an opportunity at the end. A lot of these people are very technical people who are very passionate about what they do. And then they would love nothing more than to have someone say, hey, I saw your presentation. I saw your email at the end of it. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I had some follow-up questions. Those people are really eager to get, can be really good resources. And, and again, that's about building re, building relationships, which is uh, again, the hardest thing to replicate in this virtual environment. So let's talk about uh, exhibitors. Uh, what, do, what does a virtual exhibitor need to do to encourage people to take that extra step to, to, uh, to contact them? Natasha. I mean, it comes down to content is always king. You need to make sure that you are offering content that is relevant for your audience, aligns with your brand, um, that's engaging, makes people want to learn more, um, and doing it in a way that is fun, maybe a little bit more relaxed, um, letting people breathe a little, um, all of those things help coming in from being uh, from an exhibitor point of view, I would think. Right. Anyone else? But I'll throw one thing out there, Chris, and that is um, for many years I've been doing these trade shows. In fact, probably 25, uh, almost 30 years worth of trade shows. And um, what I always found frustrating was as an engineer, I should say, for that when I was in that role for many years, is walking into a booth of a vendor and saying, I need to have whatever question is answered. And then I would get frustrated because the person I wanted to speak with, well, they're gone to lunch, or maybe they didn't come to that show, or they had to leave a day early, all kinds of reasons for that kind of thing. I believe what this is gonna allow us to do, uh, and I'll say from a vendor standpoint, is to have those people available that can have the right conversations when the uh, attendee wants to have the conversation. It doesn't have to be all the time or 24 seven, but certainly having them available 
uh, at least at the right times. Great, so now I think we're coming up on the end of our time. Let's put our futurist hats on uh, for those of you who have them. Uh, they look like my Fiji skate as bulk. <laughs> Uh, let's look ahead a few years in the future. I, again, we're, we're rapidly uh, trying to solve this problem on our feet. Uh, let's look ahead a couple of years to when we're finally starting to get this stuff right. Uh, what does that look like? Dave? Uh, I think that in the, in the next five years, things are going to come back much closer to normal. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the, the biggest threat to us in five years has got more to do with weather than it does to do with coronavirus. So... Um, you know, I, I think realistically what you might see is a little bit of some hybrid options for the shows where they're, they're keeping some of the technologies, some of the things that have been developed and worked well um, in terms of the virtual show. They may be making that available so that maybe you do have your booth, but you actually do have somebody available for, um, you know, a virtual presence or whatever has worked there. So he like says, I, but I think that they say in five years time, things will be more or less back to normal. Yes, I you wonder. Know, you did a great point there. If I could just say something real quick, Chris. And, and you're talking about the um, how it might be five years from now, the interactive part. You know, when, when people have come into our booth the last couple of years, if they wanted to connect in to you know, virtually with a, a, a you know their iPad or their telephone, their cell phone, they could connect into our application and see information. You know, we had our iPads all around the booth as well. Think about how that might also apply in the future as well. What if VT Skate were running in a cloud environment and now the user could connect in using the VIC and actually configure a screen while we're doing a presentation on the screen? All of a sudden, everything comes, comes uh, you know, really life to them. And then they can start applying that to how they're going to uh, approach you know, their own projects. Right. And that's similar to what I was thinking, which is uh, or an extension where uh, all this technology that we think is going to replace uh, attending a trade show is actually in the future going to augment the trade show experience. For those who attend, they'll be able to do, like you say, uh, actually go in and work in an application or uh, be able to get the contextual information they need uh, wherever they are at the trade show. So let's uh, finish things off with uh, the near future. So as the world begins to to slowly open and try to find ways to uh, to, to put our toe back in the water of, of people actually meeting each other, what are some of the things, uh, some of the strategies going forward? Natasha. Um, I know... Uh a strategy for us for uh, VT Skate Fest 2021 planning. Um, it's it's going to be a game change game changer. We can't really give you all the details right now. There's a lot in the works. It's going to impress the socks off of people. Um, I think as VT Skate Fest has already done uh, year after year, it just keeps getting better and bigger and better. And um, so stay tuned for details on what's coming from us for sure. All right, there you go. Keep your uh, keep your eyes peeled. So thanks, everybody. Again, nice to share a screen with you all at the same time. <laughs> thanks, Chris. Well, thanks, Chris. Hopefully thanks, we'll Chris. see each other in person soon. Bye. <laughs> Great. And now we're time for our last prize of the day. So open up your emails again and go up to the to field. And there you're going to type natasha.lutz at trihedral.com. And in the subject line, you're going to type, Chris? Weftech Connect. Right, so WebTech Connect, just as you see it on the screen, you can also copy it from the chat box, assuming Natasha's online and she's put it in there now. While you're at it, uh, just take your right hand, uh, move it down to the uh, bottom right of the live stream page and click the red subscribe button just to make sure that gets done. Right, and that'll give you the latest content from Trihedral and from the Automation Village. Great. Uh, so that brings us to the end of another episode. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thanks to all of our presenters and panelists for sharing all of their wisdom. And we look forward to seeing you uh, live on the virtual trade show floor coming up this month. Right. Awesome. Yeah. So we're going to be the AWWA show, WebTech Connect, and we're also going to be that next Automation Village episode in October. So we'll see you guys there. I hope you have a fantastic day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.